Welcome everyone. Um, wonderful to see you all here today. Let's, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm Stacy Mitchell. I'm the co-executive director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and I am so excited about today's event. And apparently I'm not alone. We had over 400 people register, and it's just so great to see you all uh, uh, join today. Across the country, um, communities are really struggling with a food system that no longer works very well. Over the last 30 years, we've seen extraordinary consolidation, corporate consolidation across the food sector. Um, and in particular, we've seen extreme concentration in the grocery sector. Just five giant retail chains now capture about half of all grocery sales. And one company, Walmart, captures one out of every $4 that Americans spend on groceries. That level of extreme concentration has led to a host of problems. One major problem stems from the fact that these big retailers grew in part by using predatory tactics to drive independent local grocery stores out of business. That's meant uh, a host of problems for all of us in terms of less competition, less choice for everyone, rising prices recently, uh, no matter where you live. But it's also meant that many communities have been left without grocery stores altogether. Uh, independent retailers, independent grocers have long served communities that the chains have bypassed. And as they've disappeared, it's left hundreds of communities, particularly rural communities and black and brown neighborhoods and cities without access to fresh food. More recently, we've seen this just incredible proliferation of dollar stores. Uh, dollar General and Family Dollar have overrun neighborhoods and rural regions. Nearly half of all new stores that have opened in the last two years have been the dollar chains. And it's really easy to see these dollar stores and think, well, they're a, a, a byproduct of economic distress. But as our research has shown and the work of others has shown, these stores are actually a, a cause of economic distress, that they're undermining local communities, driving out local businesses and creating far more harm than good. When ILSR first started doing research and reporting on this uh, set of issues a few years ago, we were overwhelmed with like emails and calls from communities across the country that were struggling with how to address these issues. Since then, we've seen just this incredible grassroots reaction. Um, cities and towns across the country have risen up. Um, we've had over 50 communities adopt laws uh, limiting the proliferation of dollar stores. Lots of cities now are working on strategies to create and grow and develop locally owned grocery stores. And in fact, in the last year or two, we've seen new local grocery stores open in places that had for more than a decade uh, been food deserts. It's really, um, I'm, I'm today we're really fortunate to have with us um, some of the, the leading lights of those grassroots efforts. We've got uh, folks who are fighting dollar stores. We've got uh, uh, local grocery store owners, uh, including uh, someone who started a new grocery store in the last couple of years. Um, and we've got an expert from Farm Action who's gonna help us understand the connections uh, across the food system uh, and, and consolidation. But first, you know, at the same time that we have this incredibly exciting activity at the local level, we also have really encouraging developments at the federal level. For the first time in a long, long time, we have antitrust enforcers who get it, who recognize that not checking monopoly power is wreaking havoc on our communities. Um, and we're very fortunate today to have one of those leaders, Commissioner Alvaro Bedoya of the Federal Trade Commission, as our keynote speaker. Um, before I introduce him, a couple of quick housekeeping items. We are recording this event. We'll share the recording out afterwards, and we're going to also post it to our website. Um, we've got some good research uh, and more discussion around these issues coming. So if you'd like to keep up with that, um, I encourage you to sign up for ILSR's newsletter and also check out our Building Local Power podcast. Um, many of our panelists today have done longer interviews on the podcast. So if you want to hear more from them, that's a great way uh, to, to catch up with them. Uh, second housekeeping thing, if you have a question, please submit your question uh, in the Q&A function. Um, we will try to get to some of those as we go along today. Um, your questions will go directly to the moderator. Um, I don't believe that you'll see them publicly, but go ahead and submit them there and we'll try to get to a few of those if we can. And with that, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Alvaro Bedoya, who one year ago, um, uh, one year ago this month was sworn in as a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. 
Um, prior to his nomination at the FTC, he was the founding director of the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law, where he was also a law professor. Welcome, Commissioner Bedoya, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be a, uh, associated with the folks who are going to be on the panel today and uh, ILSR. Thank you. Um, you know, when I when I first met you, it was after President Biden had nominated you, but before you'd been confirmed. And of course, you you know, you have this deep background in privacy, but you were busy learning uh, all about antitrust uh, yes. when we first caught up. And you said to me, I think I've got it. I think it's all about groceries, prescriptions and paychecks. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, here is someone who understands what these laws are all about and why they why they matter so much. You've also been on this mission of really saying that the Federal Trade Commission needs to return to this idea of fairness mm. as, as a guiding principle and how we enforce those laws. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, about that and about how you approach your work at the commission. Sure, thank you. And, and I don't know if I get it, but, uh, but I'm, I'm trying. And um, uh, I think what was happening when we talked was, uh, you know, I was ordering these antitrust treatises uh, um, to read in my basement office while I waited uh, for my votes. And the funny thing that happens when you do that is you come away with this pretty specific picture of antitrust that portrays it as uh, being all about efficiency, you know? And so there's lots of graphs, there's some equations, and um, and it's all about maximizing efficiency. And I think the you know, the danger from this is that it this portrayal of antitrust hides its history. You know, it hides why we have antitrust laws and it hides its promise. It hides its importance. It, it hides how they can help us. And so it, I'll, I'll say just a beat or two on, on those. Um, you know, uh, uh, if you look back at 1890, right, the nation's first antitrust law, the Sherman Act, um, people in Congress weren't talking about efficiency, not at all. You know, they were talking about Standard Oil and John Rockefeller. They were talking about the Beef Trust, the Sugar Trust. Uh, um, uh, and they, you know, we don't have antitrust laws because John Sherman was enamored uh, of efficiency. We have them because farmers and laborers around the country uh, flooded Congress demanding this law as they had done state capitals across the country. And so that's a very different founding story for antitrust than the one you read in, in what, what lawyers and law students call the horn books, the treatises. Um, and, and secondly, you know, you, you, you really miss why antitrust matters. And, um, you know, so I was reading these treatises, but I was also trying to get at the people that, that, you know, who could be protected by these laws and who are harmed when, when, you know, not enough is done to enforce them. And um, I, I dug deep into healthcare, and, and I came across some some horrible stories. But I'll just share one that I actually heard a couple of weeks ago. Um, and and these, these are all stories where there's you know ostensibly it's efficient that this thing happened, but but none no one could look at it and say that's a fair market. You know that, that's that's fair. So um, you know I sat down with some pharmacists from Louisiana, and. You know, they were talking about what happened after Hurricane Ida and these two parishes south of, of New Orleans. And normally this area is served by 50 or 60 pharmacies. But, you know, the day after the hurricane came by, it was just about five or six. It was like a Walmart supercenter and then five independents. And what started happening is that uh, all of these, you know, people who normally go to one pharmacy started going to one of these five or six pharmacies. And they were showing up with prescriptions for must have. You don't you don't go to the pharmacy that after a hurricane to fill you know something you don't really need. People are showing up with prescriptions for insulin, and the pharmacists obviously had insulin behind the counter, but they were getting served these notices of do not fill. They have to go you know across the parish to this chain pharmacy, which was either closed or flooded. And uh, um, and why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because. You know, over the last decade, decade and a half, we've seen this wave of vertical integration where we used to have independent PBMs, independent pharmacies, independent insurers, and now most of the American public 
uh, when they fill a prescription, it's one of these three vertically integrated entities that serves them. And one of the promises of this was efficiency. And, and there's a real argument that it's efficient for this entity to steer patients to their the pharmacy that they own. But uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's fair. I don't, I don't think it's fair. And, um, and so all that's a long way of saying is that I think we need to return to our statutory mandate, which is to police against unfair methods of competition. And one of the things I'm proud, uh, uh, one of the reasons I'm proud to call Chair Khan a colleague uh, uh, and the chair of the commission is that she has made sure that we are full length, we using the authorities that Congress gave us to their full capacity and uh, in the spirit and, and, and letter uh, uh, that they gave them to us. And so that's, that's kind of the idea that, that, that I was driving at. You know, it's so interesting. I, I think that I'm, I may, may have learned this this from Chair Khan, uh, Chair Lena Khan. Um, maybe it was from you, but uh, that, you know, if you read through all of the, the antitrust statutes, the word efficiency doesn't appear anywhere in the text, right. but, but fairness right. is That's all right. over the place. Um, right. So, I mean, I think one of the things that's hard for Americans to understand, ordinary people to understand who are kind of learning about antitrust is like how it was that the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, which is the, you know, the other agency that, that polices these laws, sort of decided not to do what was written on the page. Um, and, you know, I know one of the laws that you, as you went back um, through the legislative re uh, record, one of the laws that you started looking at was this law called the Robinson Patman Act. That's right. Um, which, as I understand it, has not been enforced in a, in, in a long time. Can you talk a little bit about the history of that law and sort of how you can, how was it that you just put that on the shelf? How did that happen? Yeah. I think one thing that's happened is that there have been these caricatures that have been built up around some of these laws. And, um, and, and some of them have been built up, you know, um, uh, just you know the way history works. You know, funny funny stories come out, and some have been built up purposefully as a way of neutralizing them. And I think, unfortunately, the latter is the case around Robinson Patman. Um, so, uh, what? Let's take a step back and ask what this law is. And uh, um, so, in the 1930s, there was a wave of chain stores that were that were going into um, small town America, and um, and they weren't playing fair. They were demanding secret rebates, secret discounts, such that, you know, even when these small retailers would um, would bundle up orders or kind of try to match these order volumes, they wouldn't, they just wouldn't be able to access these, these secret discounts and rebates. And they started demanding a level playing field. And so Congress passed a law. Um, and by the way, price discrimination has been, was illegal since 1914, but there are all these little ways in which uh, um, these chain stores, primarily the AMP, was getting around those laws. So Congress passed this law known as Robinson Patman for its two leading sponsors. Uh, um, Congress passed the law to fill those gaps to make sure that uh, these rural communities, predominantly small town communities, that that independent retailers had a level playing field on which to compete. And um, and so there's been this caricature, this very effective caricature of this law that the Congress that passed it was solely, uh, uh, was just wanted to protect the independent retailers at all costs because apparently they held this tremendous sway over Congress, these small town, rural, independent retailers, as we know is a huge juggernaut, you know, uh, uh, in, in legislation. And uh, uh, you know, maybe they were in the 1930s, but if you actually open up the congressional record, what you read is not a Congress that is single-mindedly focused on protecting small retailers, what you read about and what you hear, you know, on the floor of the House and the floor of the Senate is a bunch of congressmen and a bunch of senators who are really worried about rural Americans and about making sure that they have access to good groceries and not just good prices, but also good service. And, and also stores that are grounded in their communities that serve their communities. Um, and that often do it better than the chains. So one thing that comes out is, uh, um, is that Congress had a really acute sense of how independents did things differently than the chains. Number one, they provided delivery. The chains did not. Number two, they offered credit 
and the chains did not. Now, you know, if if you're fairly well to do or or you know have a comfortable middle class life, credit may seem like it's nice. Uh, uh, if you come from a working class background, you know, know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck, miss some of those paychecks. Credit is a lifeline. And 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 there was a moving pack, pa, uh, uh, passage in one of these debates. There was a John Nichols representative. John Nichols of Oklahoma said, "You know, no chain store in my community has ever carried the widow Jones and her two little kids on their books for thirty or sixty days, uh, or for however long it, it it takes to get her back on her feet again." Uh, and and this just speaks to this really rich record of how Congress understood that these independent grocers, these rural grocers did something different for their communities that others didn't. And so, I, look, to answer your question, I think two things happened. I think that uh, um, this efficiency framework uh, uh, came to be dominant in, in starting in the late 70s, but then, you know, exploding in the 80s. And, um, and look, I think, I do think, you know, uh, that, that, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, the law wasn't enforced as effectively as it could have been. Sometimes there were some small retailers that were targeted in a law really aimed at power buyers. Uh, uh, and um, and so I think a couple of things happened, but I think the long and short of it is that um, that we need to return to, to, to the why. You know, why do we have these laws? Uh, and, and, and I think if we do that, a, a lot of other decisions follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the ways that you've been, I think, you've been traveling quite a bit and and meeting with people across the country i think i saw that you were um you you were in south dakota uh meeting with a grocer uh, uh who serves the lakota community um it seems to me that that is in process of kind of reestablishing why it is that we have these laws and what the justification it is today. Can you talk a little bit about uh, about your reasons for doing those trips and what you've learned and, and what's come out of them? There's just no uh, no substitute for seeing someone face to face, for standing in their store and understanding the people they serve, why they serve them, uh, and, and what they're experiencing. So um, you're talking about a visit that that um, my colleague Max Miller and I made to um, to Pine Ridge, South Dakota, to visit with with Mr. R. F. Bowie, who's a fourth generation grocer serving the Ogallala Lakota uh, in in Pine Ridge. Um, and um, and so, look, why did we visit Mr. Bowie? You know, I saw I saw a video of him testifying. Um, uh, uh, before Congress and, and talking about what happened to his stores during the pandemic. Uh, met him briefly at, at your event, uh, I guess, I forget how long it was ago, maybe nine months ago. September, and, yeah. And he extended an invitation. And so, you know, Max and I thought we would just be sitting with him and his manager in that, you know, upstairs office overlooking the store. But instead, we spent uh, probably two hours meeting with the, Ogallala, the incoming Ogallala Lakota Tribal Council in the Dairy Isle. And what they talked about was uh, a crisis where they talked about where their the members of the community could not uh, afford uh, uh, healthy groceries. You know, um, they talked about 13 year olds showing up in emergency rooms with ulcers because by the end of the month, all they could afford was the kind of thing you, you find at a convenience store. They talked mm -hmm. about how, you know, 50% of residents over 40 uh, were uh, um, suffered from diabetes. This is a part of the country that is the lowest life expectancy uh, in the Western hemisphere outside of Haiti. And what, what the folks in that grocery aisle said was, look, we, we love the store, we love shopping here, uh, um, but, um, uh, but we, we can't afford it. And, and when we talked to Mr. Boo, he said, you know, uh, um, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, if people shop my coupons, uh, um, they could afford it and they could, and we could beat the chain stores. And so if you're listening to this, you might say, well, you know, Alvaro, you know, uh, 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 what's wrong with them shopping in a chain store? You know, why don't you want that for them? I do want that for them. Uh, uh, it's just that, you know, eight or nine of 10 residents in Pine Ridge doesn't have a car and doesn't have access to a car. And so what you'd find is it's an hour drive in each direction. So it's a two hour commute to the nearest chain store. And, um, and so these folks are having to choose between uh, 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 bundling their money to go to a chain store and making this trip or uh, uh, not having access to this food that they needed. 
Uh, um, and so that for me was, was you know, uh, uh, was food deserts 101, right? There's no, there's no replacement for actually visiting with people and understanding uh, why it's so important that we enforce the laws we have, we have on the books. Um, and, um, and yeah, so hopefully we're, we're trying to work with Mr. Johnson to see if we can visit him in, in Tulsa. Um, mm -hmm. been lucky to visit, you know, West Virginia, Utah, um, uh, uh, Iowa. Um, but, um, hope to do a lot more of that. Cause it's just, that's how I actually learn about what's, what's at stake here, um, much more effectively than anything on the page. I feel like we would have um, more effective policy making if more policymakers spent time in the dairy aisle of local grocery stores talking to folks across the country. I mean, um, I, I want to kind of ask something that's a little bit more um, getting into some of the details of, of the Robinson Patman law. You know, we're, sure. we're part of a coalition called the Small Business Rising Coalition. And so in thinking about this event, we uh, reached out to some of the other members of that coalition who are, you know, uh, small business groups and uh, our friends at the National Grocers Association, um, which represents, as, as you know, yes. uh, independent grocery stores. They were, uh, one of the things they were raising was the fact that um, sometimes like the, the dollar chains, for example, what they have done is they've gone to the suppliers and they, uh, they've said, we want special package sizes. And so the suppliers have created stuff for the dollar channel, yeah. as they say, and they'll say to independent grocers, oh, well, you can't have that. That's for the dollar channel. And that's uh, you know, a way in which they can sort of discriminate in favor of the dollar chains, give them better pricing, better terms through these special package sizes that are off limits to independent grocers. Um, there is a question about whether Robinson Patman, as, it, as it's written now, kind of gets at that issue. And I'm, I'm curious if you think that the law, like, is there is there something that Congress needs to do here to either enlarge or amend the law? Are there other ways of getting at that? So, um, first of all, let me speak in general rather than, you know, any particular store and any any particular violation of law turns on having facts and law and, and an investigation. Um, and so let me let me just speak in general. But um Look, I'm I'm a former legislative staffer, and so um, you know uh, it's it's hard to say yes or no without seeing the text of a proposal, um, and and I'd love to see uh, um, any proposals out there to to amend the law. I I will say this: I you know uh, um, together with Max, together with our colleague Bryce Tuttle, um, together with our uh, staff economist Brett Wendling and and um, uh, uh, Catherine Sanchez. Um, this is kind of my antitrust team we have um, really sunk our teeth into, into these areas in general, groceries, prescriptions, paycheck, and Robinson Patman in particular. And one takeaway, um, and Max Miller and Bryce recently did, a, did an essay, I'll, I'll push it out after, after this conversation, talking about Robinson Patman and its original intent. And I do think that there are aspects of Robinson Patman that have been forgotten that are very much still there. And, and so rather than talking about how to amend the law, um, I, I kind of think we need to also perhaps remember the aspects of the law that have been forgotten. So two quick examples. Let's first speak about this idea that if I just slap a different packaging on, on a product, I can, I can price discriminate. I can, I can deny you know, one market actor a price, you know, on the same, uh, uh, for the same, you know, uh, on the same terms as, as someone else. Um, I think this is a, 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 I think it's very interesting, this argument, because when, you know, Bryce and Max and I were going through every single page of the legislative history, you come across an amendment in the House that was proposed to allow for price discrimination on the basis of design. I think it was a, a, a amendment by Representative Pizer of New York. And uh, um, May 28th, 1936, it was, it was offered. Um, uh, and, um, and so he said, well, you know, there might be design uh, uh, differences that, that merit, uh, that merit, uh, um, that merit differences in, in, in packaging, sorry, differences in price. And that amendment failed. Uh, right. It was hmm. it was like 70 something to 16. And so Congress considered the idea that that differences in packaging 
uh, uh, could merit price discrimination, and it rejected that idea. That, that's the first thing I would say. The other thing I think is that Robinson Patman has been boiled down to this caricature of just price discrimination, 2A, right, uh, uh, 2F. Uh, um, and and I, I realize I'm getting into the weeds a little bit, but but this was a this was a good you know uh, um, you know nuanced question. I want to give a nuanced answer. A lot of people forget about 2C. Which is uh, which is about middlemen and and kickbacks, and the origin of two C was uh, there were these um, the A and P would say the suppliers say oh you know we'll we'll take the same price as everyone else we'll, we'll take we'll pay the same price, but um, if you want to sell to us you have to go through our broker, and here's the broker and actually it's not our broker it's your broker and so you got to pay a brokerage fee to that broker, and so this broker was getting paid was getting kickbacks. Uh, uh, um, and getting paid on both sides. And so 2C was about kind of enforcing a duty of loyalty for those middlemen. And, and it was a mainstay of FTC enforcement, but now it's largely been forgotten. And so for me, you know, I'm not in Congress. I don't choose to vote. You know, I, I can't choose what the law is. I, it's just my job to enforce it. And for me, we're focused on, uh, on, on reviving all aspects of the law, not just the ones that have gotten the most attention. And you have to shut me up, Stacey, by the way, if I'm, if I'm rambling. Uh, oh, no, not at all. This is great. Okay. That's That was fantastic. And that bit of legislative history is really interesting. There's all sorts of stuff in there, yes. Yeah, really fascinating. Um, well, we've got just a couple minutes left. And cool. I, um, I think what I want to ask you to, in closing here is, you know, we've got a big audience here um, and, and folks all across the country who are kind of working in their communities trying to address some of these issues, you know, whether it's the lack of grocery stores, whether it's uh, rural areas being squeezed, uh, you know, as, as farmers are being squeezed and so on. And, um, and, you know, people are coming up with all kinds of creative grassroots strategies for addressing some of these things and beginning to rebuild food access and, and local grocers and so on. You know, how do you, what are, what are the, are, are there ways in which folks working at the local level can be connected and help push along what you're trying to do at the federal level in terms of, of bringing back this idea of fairness into antitrust enforcement? I would say two, two things. Um, the first is, is to do what you all are doing here with the panel that's about to happen and what you do on the podcast. And, and um, I'm a huge fan. Uh, um, because it, it, I think the moment you talk about all of this as antitrust, even anti-monopoly, which connects a little bit more, mm -hmm. you lose a portion of, of the audience that doesn't, frankly, does not know what those words mean. Um, but when you talk about it in terms of, you know, there are people, you know, who woke up after a hurricane in Louisiana who can't get their insulin because their insurer is trying to send them to the pharmacy that they own, not the one that is open and that they are standing in, you know, I think everyone perks up uh, uh, because they, they understand at a visceral level why that matters. And so the first suggestion would be to, to talk about what you see and what you are living, not in terms of antitrust enforcement, you know, uh, um, and I've done it here. I've talked about Robinson Patman. And the moment I say those words, I, I you know, uh, a lot of the folks who are here care about this, but but may not know what the heck that means. And that's a problem. And so talking about it in terms of how you, your family, your business are suffering uh, uh, because people, there's not a level playing field and we need one uh, uh, and how your community is suffering because of that and how your products are better and your service is better and you serve people differently than your competitors, but you can't, uh, win often because of that unlevel playing field. That I think is 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 the first thing. And the second thing is to is to tell your story to people in positions of power. You know, tell it to your local news, tell it to your you know evening nightly news, tell it to your state legislator, tell it to your member of Congress. Uh, um, and and I you know I think that there's a lot of work being done in state capitals, Minnesota, New York, uh, um, a lot of work being done you know down the street here uh, um, in D.C. But we need more of those voices, and and uh, you know I think particularly if you tell it in terms of you know hey I'm a community grocer and uh, um, and even when I bundle all of my sales together, uh, purchased it together with other independents across the country, I don't have access. 
to the prices in the big boxes. And as a result, the people I serve who are living paycheck to paycheck, uh, who are working class, blue collar people, cannot afford uh, uh, the food they need. Uh, I think that's a compelling story and I think everyone will listen. Thank you so much. Uh, I love that answer. And I thank you all so much for the work that you're doing. And thank you so much thank for you joining us today. It's been extraordinary. Thank you. Vice versa. Look, it's the other way around. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, and with that, I am very excited to turn things over to our panel. And I'm going to turn uh, turn things to our incredible moderator today. We have Rana Furhar, who is the global business columnist and associate editor at the Financial Times. Um, she's also CNN's global uh, economic analysis. Rana is um, one of the most astute observers of our political economy that I know of and has written several excellent books, but I really particularly want to encourage everyone to pick up a copy of her latest book, which is called Homecoming. And it, it, it's, the subtitle is The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. And it's just this incredibly insightful look at how globalization has run its course. And we have a new age of economic localization at hand. And of course, this is um, you know, near and dear to ILSR's uh, concerns and interests. And I know for many people in the audience, um, so uh, please be sure to pick up that book. And with that, Rana, over to you. Awesome, thank you, Stacy, so much. And first of all, I just wanna thank you for having me on this panel. Um, what you guys do is so important and I call on you so often as a resource, so really appreciate it. Um, let me take a minute and introduce our really extraordinary panel, and then we're going to spend a little time in conversation. And I just want to remind folks that um, that are listening that you can push questions um, to uh, to the Institute team, and they'll forward them on to me. So with that, let me just introduce our panel. Uh, we've got Angela Huffman, who is the co-founder of Farm Action. Um, she's a national voice on anti-monopoly issues. And she's also uh, renewing, as I understand it, a 200 year family tradition and becoming the sixth generation family farmer uh, in Northwest Ohio on the family farm homestead, which is so great. I met some of the farm action team um, a few months back actually in Missouri while I was filming a documentary to go along with my book. So love the work that you guys do. Um, we've also got Michael Gay who is the manager of Food Fresh, uh, a full service independent grocery store in Claxton, Georgia. And it's owned by Michael's family. And he's uh, very active in the State Grocers Association. Um, and he advocates for solutions to predatory buying practices, which is a huge issue. Um, and we're gonna dig into that in just a few minutes. We also have the Reverend Dr. Donald Perryman, who is the senior pastor, he has served, sorry, as the senior pastor of the Center of Hope Community Church in Toledo, Ohio. And um, that's been since 1992. And this church is bringing not only spirituality, but a, a sort of a discussion around economics, politics, the social life of the community. Um, love that you're knitting all that together and that you're also using your podium to organize some reigning in the dollar stores, which I'll ask you about. And then we've got Aaron A.J. Johnson, who is the CEO and owner of Oasis Fresh Mart, which is a privately owned grocery store uh, that opened in North Tulsa in a food desert in uh, May of 2021. Black owned grocery store and a nonprofit with wraparound community services. Love that idea. I love food as the center of the community, which it just is. Um, uh, and I believe that you are the first black owned grocery store in this area for 50 years. So welcome to all of you. Um, Angela, let me start with you. Um, and maybe we can tie together some of the kind of very 35,000 foot ideas that the commissioner was talking about to what's happening on the ground. Maybe take a minute or two and just give me your thoughts about how, uh, you know, the lax anti and trust enforcement that we saw really until the Biden administration came in and started, you know, kind of changing things. How has that um, turned into this scenario that we see now everywhere on the ground where you've got food deserts, you've got huge consolidation, um, you have really a limited access to health, fresh, fresh food in many parts of the country? Sure. Well, what we're seeing is that when grocery stores consolidate, Everybody along the supply chain down to the farmer is really feeling the sting of that. And I'll give you a, a few really quick examples. When dollar stores come in and displace independent grocers, farmers lose a local purchaser. Dollar stores usually don't buy meat and produce. If they do, they don't buy it from local farmers. Hmm. We saw when Albertsons acquired Safeway in 2015, 
Albertson kept contracts only with its largest produce suppliers and dropped most of the smaller Safeway produce suppliers. Hmm. When um, in the case of Walmart, they didn't want to go to a supplier for their dairy products at all. They wanted to own and control the supply. So they dropped their dairy supplier, which was Dean Foods, which caused Dean Foods to have to cancel more than 100 contracts with dairy farmers across eight states. And within wow. two years, Dean Foods was bankrupt. So that's so um, interesting. That ripple effect. I mean, I love the way you're quantifying that because this is a whole ecosystem. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, we think that if the government doesn't start enforcing antitrust laws, there isn't going to be anyone left in the supply chain except for that handful of giant grocery stores. Okay. Michael, that's maybe a good transition to talk to you about how you see this as somebody that's really doing business on the ground. Um, you guys have, as I understand it, the only store in Evans County for 20 miles. Um, there are a bunch of uh, dollar chains within a five mile radius, a lot of concentration. Um, you often have to pay a higher price. That translates again, ripple effect into higher prices for the consumers. How do you stay in business? I mean, what what's the model here? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Um, uh, my county is roughly 10,000 people and uh, within about 20, 25 miles, the next nearest what you would consider a full fledged grocery store. Um, but within a five mile radius, there are approximately eight different uh, dollar chains. Um, and yet, if, if you were to ask people around town, I'm the one that has a monopoly in town. Uh, I'm the only mm -hmm. grocery store. Um, if, if you look at uh, my Google reviews, for example, mm -hmm. uh, every negative review I have is pricing. Um, oh, wow. even, some of the, even some of the good ones are great store, really clean, fresh meat produce, uh, but um, price is a little high. Um, so it's obviously something we've been fighting literally for 43 years now. Um, but just like that, we buy a ton of local produce, you know, from, from guys like that. So when you do that, I'm able to get that a lot cheaper. So, uh, when you look through, um, my meat and produce, I'm actually, you know, fairly in line where we really get hammered is, is in the middle of the store, the, the big box and the dollar places just kill you on those. Cause they're buying in such multiples. And um, and they're able to purchase it, it just so much cheaper. And then even when our warehouse may go to try to get that price, they're just you know told, well, that package is not available to you or that's a club pack. And so it, it does become hard. And that's why the community involvement, the um, you know, being as you know as clean as possible, people still do care about that. Um, I, you know, there's probably not a day goes by that I don't still bag groceries on the floor. Um, mm. And so that service, mm. you know, it is is why you get that negative positive review where people are like, man, I just like going there, but you know, I wish the prices were lower. Well, yeah, you know, me too. It, it, uh, like I've told people before, you know, the same formula my granddad used to figure pricing in the store is the same one we use today. <laughs> That's uh, so every, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Every department has a percentage you need to make in it. Um, the only thing that changes is input cost. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, over the years, my input costs have changed. And I want it. Uh, I want to actually just bookmark that for listeners because sure. what you're describing is, again, it's a whole ecosystem. I mean, you're talking about economies of scale that are part of this efficiency model that has essentially been encouraged for half a century in this country where the big get bigger and it really becomes at all levels of the food system. Uh, difficult to remain in business if you're a smaller mid-sized supplier. I'm going to come back to you um, on some of the, the design issues, but I want to go um, to the Reverend Perryman. Um, Reverend, I'm really interested in why you chose food security, food availability, grocery issues as something that was important to the community. Why that as opposed to any other thing that you could have chosen to focus your activism on? Back in two. 2015, I really was frustrated by false narratives. For example, if a person resides in a food desert or does not have enough money to afford food, telling them that if they eat healthy, they would be healthy. To me, oh. that uh, did violence to a certain uh, group of people. When that uh, is just not true, it does nothing to address the source of their ill health. And then we were seeing a mass exodus at that time of grocery stores from those neighborhoods that were formerly 
flourishing. So when the dollar stores uh, attempted to build um, a brand new store in a historic area known as the block that was formerly thriving, it was rich in food, art, music, culture, uh, activism, home to over 70 businesses, professional offices before years of disinvestment put that community on life support. And as a result, um, uh, money was more money was going out than coming in, and that money was going uh, to uh, places other than Toledo. Uh, we did some research. Uh, there was a community assessment, a health assessment that uh, confirmed um, that um, predominantly rural and low income Black and Latino deserts. Uh, were impacting neighborhoods in many interconnected ways, including public health, education, quality, housing, and safety. The Toledo mm -hmm. Police Department uh, provided crime statistics that indicated that dollar stores elevate crime in the neighborhoods that we were wow. uh, uh, serving. Uh, they were experiencing staffing issues, closing early, opening late, had long lines at the register, and, and several of my parishioners were complaining about inaccurate registers that bring up different product pricing than that listed wow. on the shelves. Huh, that is, I, that's so interesting because you're sketching again an entire chain of events and a, so, a negative, sort of negative externalities of this, this pro, seemingly isolated problem, which is actually part of a, a larger systemic problem. Um, AJ, I want to get you to weigh on this. First of all, I want to amplify um, what the Reverend is saying. I, I drove through Missouri actually for a number of hours while filming my documentary on food systems recently. And I couldn't find a fresh vegetable. And it just amazed me because this is a place that is produced. It's one of the bread baskets of the country in cash crops, but not necessarily in the fruits or vegetables that one would need nutritionally. I wonder if you can jump in and kind of describe your own experience in Tulsa with food access, food deserts, and again, you know, how that connects to other issues, security, crime, unemployment, um, economic justice. Yeah, first of all, thank you all so much to, you know, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, Commissioner Bedoya and yourself and the other guests on the, the panelist on here in North Tulsa, uh, where we are. We are the only grocery store in 14 years and the first black owned in over 50 years. And sadly, unfortunately, in a food desert, there are medical deserts, there are educational deserts, there's public health deserts, mm -hmm. uh, there's broadband deserts, but most importantly, entrepreneurship deserts, home ownership mm -hmm. deserts, but most importantly, sometimes uh, the intrinsic hope desert because huh. that cycle of generational poverty continues to go over and over. And I need to apologize, my daughter, I have three daughters and she wanted to paint daddy's nails last <laughs> week. As you can see, I only let her do one hand. So I talk with my hands, I'll be using one hand. Uh, but <laughs> We'll remember uh, what you're saying better because of your, you can tell her that, your nails. Exactly. And so for us in North Tulsa, the life expectancy is 11 years shorter than mm -hmm. any other community in Tulsa. Wow. Said, it, said a different way, people are dying 11 years faster in North Tulsa than any other community. And as we look at food deserts across the country, you know, prior to COVID, 30 plus million people lived in food deserts. After COVID, 53 plus million people live in food deserts. So one in seven people. And so the, the, the working class, the middle class, but you also have the working poor that are in underserved communities where they may make too much money for additional assistance, but they're just over that threshold. So all of a sudden we have this continued cycle of generational poverty that really plagues underserved and low income communities. And so for us kind of like what Michael is doing, that power of being a local uh, grocer, shout out to Michael, man, 40 years in the game, we just turned two years old. So any uh, magic or wizards that you can send us in the sustainability <laughs> game, that, that's our goal. And that's why we focus on our for-profit as well as our nonprofit and couple them together because we believe if there are transportation issues, 
if there are workforce development issues, it may take multiple different visits in, or, uh, to different businesses or state agencies to get what a family may need. But if we can bring those in a one-stop shop and be the center of the community, we believe that's how you create and restore underserved communities back to hopefully thriving communities. Wow, there is, okay, for starters, I'm definitely calling you for a future column because there is a lot in what you just said that is fascinating. One thing that you're making me think is that I almost feel like I want to start looking now at availability of grocery local lo local grocery st stores and independent grocery stores as an economic indicator because you're telling me it's it's almost like if you had a map you would be able to map on all these other issues life expectancy um you know the safety and and equity of the community i'm also interested in, and and angela i'm going to come back to you on this 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 supply chain post covid issue i mean in a way this was an opportunity particularly around food, because, you know, we all kind of have this felt experience. Suddenly COVID hits, groceries are, you know, there, there's lines at grocery stores. You can't get stuff. Restaurants are closed. There's a clear supply and demand mismatch that efficiency theory tells us shouldn't be happening, but it clearly was happening. It's gotten worse in some cases. Um, how, how should we be thinking about this? And again, um, how to connect the dots between what the commissioner is doing and um, what we could all be doing just as consumers. Sure. Well, what we've seen during the pandemic is big retailers and food processors taking advantage of their dominant position to hike up prices on consumers, pay farmers less, and rake in record profits. You know, during the pandemic, countless mom and pop uh, stores really struggled to stay afloat. Um, the grocery store where I was selling my eggs went under, but at the same at the same time, revenue for Walmart hit three hundred forty one billion dollars, which was three percent higher than the previous year. Um, we saw it with egg prices earlier this year. Farm Action Research um, exposed how dominant egg companies that experienced zero cases of bird flu use that excuse anyway to more than double their prices. And yeah. consumers aren't the only ones suffering. Today, only 15 cents of every dollar that we spend at the grocery store goes back to the farmer. So, um, you know, policy-wise, I think we need to put a stop to the stealing of the profits out of the farmer's pocket and the money from the pockets of our consumers. You know, the, this price gouging issue is a huge deal. And I think it's an underreported issue in terms of the inflation picture, um, not just in the US, in fact, but globally. Um, I, 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 Michael, maybe I'll come to you. And, you know, AJ was asking for a little advice um, from a 40 year <laughs> veteran. <laughs> um, it, it, and <laughs> sorry. No, I, I, go ahead. <laughs> um, it, you know, I, you mentioned service. And I think the end and the kind of knowledge of the community, like a deep knowledge, 40 years. I mean, you probably know individuals, you probably know families. Is there a way in which you are able to leverage that at all in your business? Uh, yeah, you know, to a point, I mean, uh, in our, uh, our family had some stores in Savannah area that uh, we don't have any owner common ownership with, but uh, that's kind of where everybody started. But literally in those stores, you've seen sometimes the third and maybe the fourth generation, depending on how old the grandma might have been when you started. Um, and so, you know, just that... Um, longevity of being around kind of buys you a, a little bit of a, a credit but um to the efficiencies part of that you know efficiencies sound like they would work better in chains but what what becomes of that is that the efficient the local guy at a box a local chain store is not a, allowed to call anybody that's not approved by his company for him to call so mm -hmm. when covid hits right um savannah has a really huge saint patrick's day and it's about 40 miles from us well, St. Patrick's Day got canceled in the first mm. year of COVID, right? And so there's literally these restaurant supply people who have just boatloads of food available. So I never ran out of hamburger meat at all during COVID. Mm. I had people drive past 15 different chain stores from South Carolina, which is about two and a half hours from here, to come to my store in little old Claxton, Georgia, to buy hamburger meat. And why is that possible? Because the day all that hit the fan, it was it was Friday the 13th of March of 2020, Friday the 13th, when it all happened for us. Um, so I was on the phone that afternoon with people that we have relationships with, don't buy a ton from, who have restaurant 
who supply mainly restaurants. And we said, what do you got? We'll take everything, mm. you know, thousands of, I mean, a bill from them might be a, a good month. It might be $2,000 from a place like that. That week was $50,000 for us. Wow. Uh, that's, that's so interesting. You know, <clears throat> I have heard that from a, a number of other um, small grocery and sort of community food pantries that they just, that their, their demand boomed. And it really reflects to me this very big global economic story that I'm covering right now, which is the shift from efficiency to resiliency, you know, which has to be local. It has to be about creating, you know, um, more redundancy in communities, more of a connection um, with folks like you. Real, real quick follow-up question. Um, what could the commissioner and other authorities be doing to help you right now? I mean, is there something that you're seeing that we we're not discussing at the policy level? Yeah, I mean, it, it really is deeper than just pricing of, of items. I mean, obviously that's the big ticket thing, but I mean, you know, I, I know some guys that work for some really big, you know, uh, providers of food, you know, like think Coke, Pepsi, Frito-Lays of the world, who when they go to work at like a Walmart, they're required to take uh, Walmart employee training. So their company is paying for them to be trained by another corporation. And they're, if, you, if you're in that store and somebody asks you a question that's a customer, you have to stop what you're doing for your job and help that customer in that store that you don't work at. Now wow. imagine if not, huh. not only are you getting better pricing, but you're also cutting your labor hours because you have other people who are paying for your you know, quote unquote, employees to be there. Imagine if I was able to steal business from some of these guys now, just because of my service, imagine what we could do if we actually enforce the laws that are on in the books to make my pricing structure actually line up where it should be. Imagine what we could do, uh, you know, to really go after these, uh, these bigger chains and to be even a bigger force in our communities. I mean, uh, so. AJ, do you just as somebody that's in the same business, what would would you add anything to that? Do you see it the same way? Yeah, I think um, in addition to that, I think taking a look at where the independent grocers are even getting their uh, their food sources from, and a great partner like the USDA, like where could we have regional hubs or regional pilot uh, food distribution programs that could really serve, uh, you know, your, your Oasis and your uh, Michael's store, fresh uh, food, fresh, um, you know, what kind of pilot programs can be in place that with the power of partnership of local farmers, local growers, that it, there can be another local co-op, I would, I would guess, uh, I don't know what other words to call it, but I think there's so many amazing things on the, on the federal level uh, mm -hmm. that exist out there that, on a food and a sustainability purpose for Michael and myself and, um, you know, the rest of the panelists that we could really benefit from as a, as a result of being a part of a think tank, but also an action oriented, taking a step, you know, as business owners, it's hard to huh. spend time talking, but we gotta, like Michael said, Hey, that, that labor, it, it's expensive. And so anything that we can do from a workforce development, because when you're serving an underserved community, the goal is to hire residents from the community right sometimes when you do that that can it can be their first job and so we're we're teaching individuals even the importance of wearing deodorant at work we have we pay for business for uniforms as a business so there's not a shame of i may not have clothes or i may not have the ability to wash my clothes so uh that other companies may not have that additional cost we That's have. so interesting. Yeah. yeah. And you're plugging into workforce training issues, education issues, which is a huge, that's a big administrative push right now at the federal level. Reverend, I want to ask you to chime in on this. What would you ask for um, in terms of federal policy um, or even state or local policy to kind of help you along with your work and, and to help the community, not just in terms of um, groceries, but just in, in all economic ways have more agency? Um, I would think that um, uh, local zoning laws that limit the number of dollar stores in low income neighborhoods, um, national policy could require dollar stores to carry um, a larger percentage of healthy food items. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, I think, I think that uh, provide funding for community development organizations to do uh, 
what the uh, previous speaker just uh, suggested, provide incentives in these areas to community development and nonprofit organizations to open grocery stores in underserved areas. Uh, also, um, education and job training program. I am uh, very, very happy to uh, report that our efforts uh, have uh, resulted in a, just last week, a $12 million capital project oh underway gosh, by our advocacy. Thank you. And that includes a, 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 a food systems education and incubation hub project, directly a result of our work and then a, a second initiative that incentivizes corner stores to carry healthy prepared foods and fresh produce and next week city council will likely approve a proposal to work with a developer of a 10,000 square foot full service grocery store wow. near the site and this was not intentional but right at the site of an old black owned edge market it's Division Street Market back in the day that wow. was an iconic institution. So I was able to take a rare bow last week, and we need more of those type of opportunities. That is so awesome. Um, I love that good news story, which we and we need more of those. I love elevating this. Um, that's one of my own missions, actually, the next two years is to start telling some good news stories <laughs> because we have so many negative ones in the media. Um, let me we've got about uh, 12 minutes or so before I have to hand back to um, Stacy, And we have a couple interesting questions coming in from the audience. So I want to, I want to put these forward. Um, Angela, this, I, yeah, go sorry, ahead. Sorry. Right Jump quick, in, I'll Michael, go ahead. Up, Dr. Yep. Perryman, uh, you know, so there's, it's great when you hear that there's, you know, all this grant money available that are, they're helping uh, stores open in food deserts. But, you know, just in our local area, we've had uh, local government reach out to us because, you know, obviously we've, we've been around for so long to offer incentives for us to open a store. And it being on this side of the of the fence, it's it's almost comical because it's if we would enforce the laws that are on the books, it'd be way cheaper to do that so that the business that was there before could have stayed in business than to let it close, let it be gone for years, and then come sure. to me and have to bring an incentive package to go, hey, we know no chain store wants to build here, but we'll we'll give you guys this money or we'll help you build this if you just come back to this area. Whereas the laws already exist that probably would have kept someone in business there already. And so, it, you know, mm. when you talk about efficiencies and stuff like that, that, you know, it's a much more efficient spending of our dollars to stop this from happening than to come with some unbelievable package to get someone to come back to an area where they yeah. already see that, you know, nobody wants to be, uh, that's, you know. That's it's, such it's, an important point. It's I, would, I would say this, uh, Michael, the issue is very clear that the causes of food deserts and communities across United States stem from one single root, and that is economic disinvestment in communities of color. Now, you, there might be different tunes. Um, uh, you may have a rural tune and, a, and an urban uh, version, but there's one song, economic disinvestment in communities of color. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, that principle of that disinvestment um, the money that they invest takes away more than it contributes. That's a mm -hmm. fact. It's interesting. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, right. I yeah. Think like I said, we're in a very urban area in our Savannah store. So it, we were there and, and, and are still fighting to survive. But there were other places when we started and everything else is closed other than us at this point. Yeah, you guys are both making really interesting points. Um, let me just jump in. I want to make sure that our attendees get to ask a couple questions. And uh, Angel, this might be one for you. Um, someone is asking, looking at the Kroger's acquisition of Albertson, they pledged lower prices and not to close any stores. How do you think these promises, uh, how do you, what do you think about these promises while also understanding that past grocery mergers like Safeway and Albertson have harmed consumers? Um, how do you get comfortable with the promises? I mean, I don't, I don't know that you do, but maybe the question is, how should regulators be thinking about this, given that the, there is a, a pretty clear history of, you know, not just in, frankly, in food, but in most mergers of a lot of promises that are not lived up on? Well, exactly. You know, that that's what we keep seeing over and over, these kind of promises um, that are not kept. So one, we oppose the, the Kroger-Albertson's merger. We would urge the FTC to um, 
not let that go through in the first place. But, but I think something else that we need to be doing with any potential future mergers or past mergers is um, a look back provision. And that's where we are over time, we are continuing to monitor those past mergers. Were the promises kept? What's going on? And wind those mm. back if needed, if, if, you know, if they have been harmful. It's, you know, I, I want to bookmark that point too. I have heard from a number of regulators, um, not just at the FTC, but at the SEC, at the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that's, that really cite activists and individuals like yourselves, as well as local journalists for tracking and elevating things, because frankly, the public sector has become so hollowed out in the last half century that the capacity for this kind of data collection is not always there. So I think that's a really nice point. Um, let me uh, go to some of our other panelists for this, this next question. Um, another attendee is asking what role can states and local government play in discouraging dollar stores? Um, Michael has already put forward an idea there and improving conditions for local groceries. Um, can you give us examples, particularly of any local ordinances that we should pay attention to? Um, AJ, Reverend, do you have any thoughts on that? I think there's a, a great resource right here on this panel, um, not just highlighting our, our own businesses, but this is an example of when the collaboration comes together and different thought leaders, but also, you know, entrepreneurs that are actually doing the work in the space, that's how we bring about change. Mm. So I think um, whether it's Angelo Michael or Dr. Reverend, Commissioner Bedoya, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, you know, reaching out to, to see how, how one can be an advocate, but also one taking a step to shop local at wherever you live, shop local, be a part of your local grocers your, or your local restaurants because uh, that bulk buying power is, un it's fortunate for those that have the, 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 the finances to buy tons of pallets and, you know, get exclusive deals. I'm not sure. I know Oasis does, and I can't speak for Michael, but if Michael and I could probably do more together than we could independently. Uh, would you mm. agree, Michael, with, with, with a nod or a thumbs up? Oh, definitely. Yeah, 100%. And so I, I think these kind of conversations help bring about the steps towards necessary change. Reverend Doctor, do you want to have a final word on that? I would say also oversight and enforcement of fair consumer pr practices, such as what was done for payday lending um, in that industry. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, uh, there's some uh, differences in what these stores are showing on the shelves and what rings up um, at the register, uh, there needs to be more oversight of that, more regulation uh, and enforcement of that. I think that would help tremendously because um, these residents, um, that slips right through the cracks often. And these, these residents are paying much more in what they're buying than what they think they are. Let me end actually with kind of a final um well, maybe forward-looking question. I'm so struck. I mean, I'm I'm incredibly blessed and lucky. I live in Brooklyn, um, in a neighborhood where we have a local, uh, independent bodega. You know, every few blocks, and um, it's not just a place to get food, but you know, my local bodega is a place where when I walk in to get a carton of milk, the owner knows that my kid has been there too late, <laughs> hanging out with the wrong crowd. Um, maybe he's keeping my keys for me because I have somebody coming to stay at my place. I mean, there is a rooting in the community that I think is so important for all small businesses, really. Um, what are your hopes, what, you know, your hopes and your wishes for the next few years based on all the conversations that we've had? Maybe we'll just do a quick speed round. Angela, why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, my hope would be that there are more independent grocery stores, more farmers, um, you know, we need more of these um, mom and pop shops and independent businesses to, so that we can have our communities rooted that way instead of the way it is now where these large global corporations are extracting the wealth out of the community and breaking those community ties. Michael. Yeah, same thing. I mean, just, you know, uh, just like AJ and I, we all we want is a, is a fair shot at what 
the law says that we should have a fair shot at. I mean, it's, you know, when you when you look back at this and you think that, that people are going to do the right thing when they get absolute power, these laws exist because the people didn't do the right thing and the government had to step in. You know, as soon as these things got enforced in the you know late 30s, you know, A&P was the place that every that no, it doesn't even exist anymore. And it's because they didn't do a good job of running their business because they didn't have to because they were so big and so mm. powerful. But they they could price everybody out of business and still make money. Um, and yeah. so you know, we, do we want that to happen again? Is that what, cause that's the path we're shooting down right at this moment. That's such a good question. It is always amazing to me how we put up with the kind of service and um, problems of concentration that we do. I think just because we're not thinking deeply enough. Um, Reverend, what are your wishes for the next couple of years? This project I mentioned, I called it my baby. You can't stop once you have the baby, you have to raise the baby. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that means raising it in a nurturing environment, making sure that you e equip it with positive influences and um, expose it to positive associations so it can thrive. I think a healthy food overlay district would do that. And uh, I've received resistance in advocating for a healthy food overlay district. I would like to see successful implementation of that. Okay, AJ, last word to you before we close up. You know, I think as we can look at food deserts and underserved communities across the country, the top two or three items are food, public health, public safety, um, and also education, economic development. If those are the same issues across every major underserved community in the country, how can we take one step or put together a, a, a plan that's actually going to be about addressing these issues, the health disparities, uh, the inequities, the mortality, and actually put together a plan that's actually going to be to bring about a blueprint to bring about change in underserved communities. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of great plans. There's a lot of great initiatives. But if we don't want, as Commissioner Bedoya said, the five retailers to essentially own the market, what are we doing, not from a defensive, but from an offensive perspective, identifying the local grocers and the local medical clinics, and how can we develop a plan to raise up the mom and pop shops to not go out of business the next 5, 10, 20 years, and mm. all of a sudden we've got AI and robots yeah. You know, yeah. telling, telling the narrative in underserved and rural communities. I think there's great opportunity to really impact people in a positive way. That is such a good place um, to to end. Um, you know, I'm really struck when sometimes when you start to think about, oh my gosh, we've got a food system or even a food fuel agricultural system that is just so dysfunctional. It feels like a really big, heavy topic. How do you even start to tackle it? But when you take it from the bottom up with some of the stories we've just heard, the solutions actually start to become really clear. So um, thank you to you all. And Stacy, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to close up. Thank you so much, Rana. You are a master uh, of, of, of orchestrating that beautiful conversation. Um, I just wanna close by uh, thanking our panelists today and thanking Commissioner Bedoya. Uh, really appreciate everyone taking time out. Um, you're all doing such incredible work uh, in your fields and in your communities. Um, and really appreciate you sharing your stories and your insights with us today. I also really wanna thank the team at ILSR. Um, we could not have put this on without just an incredible staff. And I particularly wanna call out Katie Milani, Luke Gannon, Lauren Galatly, and Kennedy Smith, who had uh, a major hand in this event coming together today. And finally, thanks to the audience. Um, we loved having you here today. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, there will be a recording of this event if you wanna share it out with uh, people who were not able to make it. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.